Hi, I'm going to be showing you how you can use a normal digital camera as a powerful tool for measuring colour and pattern. Now it's important to realise that cameras were never designed as scientific instruments. They are, they're designed for making pretty looking photos that look good to us on our computer screens or in print. So we need to be very careful in the way that we extract the photos and calibrate the photos so that we can use them for creating objective data. Next you need to consider the kind of camera that's right for your study. Now almost any camera that can record in RAW format will be suitable. It will allow you to make objective measurements. But you also need to consider the visual system of the, the, the study system that you're working with. So for example if you're just working with humans or mammals or species that just see in the same visual range as us, for example that's about 400 to 700 nanometers, then a standard off-the-shelf digital SLR or mirrorless camera will be perfectly fine for your purposes. But if you're working with other animals, for example, birds, insects, fish, reptiles, they can see down into UV, so they can often see down to 350 nanometers or more. And for, that, for working with them, you will need a special converted UV camera. I'm going to be giving examples of how to, to work with a UV camera, but the same principles also apply if you're just working with a normal visible camera um, and making objective measurements. Next you also need to consider whether you need to map your images to the cone catch of the animal that you're interested in. So for example, if your data really hinge on being able to say that this is what this animal will perceive, then you need to convert your images, and that requires a camera with known spectral sensitivities. So a normal off-the-shelf camera like this will see in red, green and blue, and that red, green and blue will be roughly similar to our human red, green and blue. It's designed to be as close as possible. But other animals see uh, in very different ways, they have very different sensitivities. We can map from camera vision to animal vision, but only if we know the camera spectral sensitivities. That's quite a difficult process to do, um, so we've published a few spectral sensitivities. So if you, if you mirror the setups that we've published, then you'll be able to convert your images from objective data um, to cone catch data. If you're working with animals that can see in ultraviolet, then you'll need a full spectrum sensitive camera. That's a camera that can see in the range from about UVA through to the human visible range and then up into infrared. There are a few camera manufacturers that made cameras that can see in that whole range, like the Fuji IS Pro. But actually the sensors of pretty much every digital camera are sensitive to those wavelengths. But the manufacturers put a filter in front of the sensor that blocks them out because obviously they're unwanted in normal photography. So you can have a professional company convert a consumer camera for you. They will take the camera apart, take the sensor off the filter, and replace that filter with a UV transparent filter. Uh, you can also do the process yourself. For example, on my website, I put up an example of how to convert this Samsung NX1000. If you're handy with a screwdriver, it's a, it's a fairly easy conversion. You just need to take it apart, take out the sensor, you don't need to replace the sensor with anything, but you've got to be aware that it, the sensor is more vulnerable without that protective filter in front of it. If you're just working with human visible spectra, then your lens choice is actually quite easy. Almost any good quality lens will probably do the job fine. I would, however, recommend avoiding zoom lenses. When a lens zooms, the, the properties of its chromatic distortion um, and radial distortion will change. So that will create slight differences in the quality of your photos when you're zoomed in compared to when you're zoomed out. So if you do have a zoom lens, I'd recommend only ever using it at the maximum zoom or the minimum zoom. A slightly better option in terms of recreating um, objective photos that will be as similar to each other as possible is to use a prime lens. Prime lenses uh, just means that they don't zoom, they're fixed at one focal length. 50 millimeters in this example, and that will ensure that every photo you take is uh, very similar in terms of its radial and chromatic distortion. If you're working with UV, the lens options are much more restricted. There are a few manufacturers that make um, ultraviolet lenses. For example, Coastal Optics makes a 105 millimeter lens and a 60 millimeter lens, and Nikon has restarted production of their UV lens. They're very good quality, they'll do the job very well, and they're also very expensive. 
So depending on your budget, you might want to go with uh, a cheaper option, which is going with an old lens. This no reflex, no flex R, 35mm lens, happens to have very good UV transmission. It was never designed as a UV lens, but it, it has um, very few elements of glass and the, the cement that's used to glue the bits of glass together doesn't absorb all the UV. This is a very easy option to use. For example, with a, a converted camera, uh, you'll generally just need an adapter like this M42 to NX adapter for the Samsung here, but you can get adapters for Nikon and Canon and pretty much any camera you want. And here you have a, a very decent ultraviolet sensitive camera. Um, this lens has fairly good um, chromatic distortion in UV. That means that when you take a photograph in visible light and then in UV light, you won't need to refocus the camera much um, or at all. Another option that's really good uh, is this Nikon Nikkor enlarger lens. Uh, only use this 80mm lens uh, and this metal variety. It happens again to have very good UV transmission and very low chromatic distortion between human visible and ultraviolet ranges. Um, and again you'll, you'll need to attach it to the camera somehow which is slightly more difficult because this is an enlarger, an enlarger lens it was designed for blowing up photos in a, in a dark room. It wasn't designed to actually put on a camera so it has no focusing mechanism. The easiest way to put it on a camera is either with a helicoid, so a helicoid is like uh, it's a tube that you twist and it gets longer and, and, and shorter. Another option is to use a, a bellows like this. So you can attach the camera at one end of the bellows and attach the lens at the other. And this is very good for macro work because it lets you have a very large focal range. Over time, lenses can develop scratches, they can accumulate dust and moisture, and even fungus growing inside them. So it's really important that you check an old lens to make sure that there's nothing that will impair its quality. The easiest way to check a lens is just by holding up a torch to your eye and looking through it. This will really highlight any imperfections inside the lens. When you take a photograph with a full spectrum camera and no filter attached, you'll notice it looks really odd. It will tend to be pink or purple. And that's because the red and blue uh, sensors in the camera are actually more sensitive to infrared than even blue and red light and then uh, ultraviolet respectively. So in order to photograph the regions that we're interested in, you need to use filters that block out the unwanted bits of the spectrum. For human visible spectra, we use this Beta UV infrared cut filter. This transmits all of the light between about 400 to 700 nanometers. And then to take UV photos, we use this Beta Venus U filter, which transmits all of the light between about 320 and 380 nanometers. Then you need to consider how you'll attach the filters to the lens. You can, of course, just use threads and screw the filters on and off. Um, but to save time and to make life easy, I built this uh, filter slider that lets you take a photo in the human visible range and then just slide across and take a UV photo. Lighting is incredibly important in all photography and that's no less true in objective photography. What your camera is essentially measuring is light that's been emitted by a light source that bounces off the objects that you're looking at and is measured by the camera. So the emission spectrum, which produces the colour of the light source, is very important. The position of the light source and the arrangement of objects nearby that are reflecting light from that light source, they're all hugely impact on the way your photo looks. So it's really important to consider lighting in any study where you're using objective photography. Of course, the, the most ecologically relevant light source in most circumstances is the sun. Um, but the sun, of course, is very unpredictable uh, because of atmospheric conditions constantly changing. So the colour and position of the sun, its intensity, uh, is very variable. So if you're working with a natural system and the sun is your most important light source, then it's fine to photograph outside, but do bear in mind atmospheric conditions. Should you always be photographing in direct sunlight, for example? Should you always be photographing uh, in cloudy conditions? They're things worth considering. 
If you're working with artificial light, if you're measuring uh, samples in a dark room or lab or museum, then the artificial light source is really important. There are lots of different options with artificial lighting, and some of them are very good and some of them are very bad, but all of them are fairly poor at recreating natural sunlight. The worst option is probably to go with fluorescent tubes. That's energy saving bulbs and the like. Um, the problem with them is they have very spiky emission spectra. That means that they emit lots of certain wavelengths and very little of other wavelengths. And if you have a, a, a very colourful object, um, the reflectance of that object might interact in weird ways with the positions of the spikes in that fluorescent light source. So fluorescent lighting is always very bad at colour recreation. The colours it produces might look quite different under another light source. So avoid them if you can. Um, a good light source for use in the dark room that we like is this Iwasaki eye colour arc lamp. Now arc lamps are again quite spiky light sources, but this one's not too bad. Um, it's been designed to try and recreate D65 lighting conditions. That's the standard uh, lighting conditions that you might typically find on, on a sunny day in the shade. Um, so this lens, is, this light is very good at recreating light similar to, to the sun. Uh, if you do get this bulb, you'll need to run it with a ballast. Uh, this is, controls the, uh, the charge of the light. It needs a very high voltage spark to get it going. Now this bulb, it comes with a, a filter that blocks out the infrared and UV range, uh, which of course normally is not wanted. Um, but you can actually remove that filter. You can use um, sandpaper, um, but that can scratch the glass. Uh, an easy way of removing the filter that doesn't damage the glass is to use a uh, steel brush uh, drill bit like this. And just work your way around the, around the bulb, scratching off as much of the filter as you can. You can see the filter as uh, a colourful rainbow oily effect that's coating the outside of the bulb. So try and remove as much as possible if you want to use this bulb for UV photography. Also bear in mind that once you do remove the UV filter, it's giving off a lot more UV light, it will fade objects nearby faster, it will damage your skin and eyes faster. So do wear skin protection if you're skin sensitive to UV, and do wear eye protection if you convert this to lamp. Light sources vary continuously in the colour and amount of light that they produce. The sun, for example, changes quite dramatically with atmospheric conditions, but even artificial light sources change as the bulbs age, as bulbs warm up, uh, or fluctuations in the voltage supplying the bulb can all cause changes in its colour and intensity. So any two photos you take are quite likely to have quite different lighting conditions. It is easy to control for that though by using grey standards. When you include a grey standard in your shot, it lets you calibrate that image to work out uh, what colour the, the light source is and to control for that so that you can uh, eliminate the differences in lighting. A grey standard can be pretty much any object that is spectrally flat. That means it reflects the same amount of light across the whole range of wavelengths that you're interested in. They also need to be diffuse. That means that any light hitting it, it bounces off equally in all directions. So there's no shininess to it at all. For normal human visible photography, a grey standard picked up in any photography shop will be fine. Um, if you're photographing very light objects, then a white standard would be sensible. For normal objects, values around 20 to 40 percent would be sensible. Uh, if you're photographing very dark objects, then use a dark standard. Um, if you're photographing in very bright conditions, if you're outside, for example, and you might have some lens flare, that's light bleeding into your, your camera from unwanted directions, that will increase the black point of your, of your photo. Uh, it's very difficult for controlling for that, um, but our software can do it if you have uh, two standards or more in your shot. Uh, if you have a light standard and a dark standard in your photograph, you can use those to estimate the black point um, and it will uh, control for any lens flare. If you're photographing in a dark room, that's unlikely to be an issue. If you're photographing in UV, then your choice of standards is, is much more limited. Uh, Spectralon is the best material, uh, but there are lots of other sintered PTFE based standards in different levels of reflectance. So this is a standard made from uh, a Zephyr sheet, sintered PTFE sheet, um, and here we have a 5% reflectance and a 95 So it's useful for simultaneously taking photos of bright or, 
or dark objects. Now I'm going to run through an example of how to take photos and then analyse them. Um, just been out into the garden and found these uh, snail shells. These helix snails, they have quite different patterns, so it'll be interesting to use in the pattern analysis. Uh, I've also uh, picked this Rebecca flower, and it'll be interesting to see what this looks like in UV, so we can simulate how a bee might see this flower. With all objective photography, it's very important to consider the lighting in your setup, how that lighting is interacting with your grey standard, and how it's interacting with the object you're trying to measure. Now, imagine the case of a butterfly wing. There you have a flat surface, so you can place the flat grey standard in the same plane. Any light hitting the grey standard will also be hitting the butterfly wing. So that's a very simple case. In practice, many objects are more complex three-dimensionally. And that means that the angles of the object will interact with the, the way they reflect light and the amount of light they reflect from a given viewpoint. Take this snail, for example. This snail is a roughly uh, spherical shape. That means the point of the snail closest to the light source is going to be reflecting much more light, there's much more light falling on it, compared to the side of the snail in shadow. So if we were to measure the reflectance, it would appear that the side in shadow is darker than the side in the light, when we know that's not the case. That's an artifact caused by a point light source like this. So if you have a complex three-dimensional shape that you're trying to photograph, it's quite important that you diffuse that light so that you have roughly equal light coming around from all angles. Uh, that's very easy to do in normal photography. Uh, you can buy tents that uh, diffuse your scene, uh, you can use large diffusers, but none of these standard uh, photography reflectance materials are suitable for use in UV. You need to use a material that is spectrally flat in ultraviolet. Um, one easy solution is to use uh, this PTFE sheet. This is 0.5mm thick uh, plastic sheet that's quite easy to buy from plastic stockists. And if I place this around the scene, you can see how it almost eliminates all the shadows from around the snail. So now when we measure the reflectance all over the snail, we'll have a pretty good estimate of its reflectance in comparison to the grey standard here. Another part of the scene that you should consider when photographing in artificial conditions is the background. Uh, here I've used a PTFE sheet as a background, uh, one and a half millimeter thick, so it's nice opaque white. Um, you can also use uh, a dark, a grey background if you want, but whatever background you use, ideally it should be uh, spectrally flat, so that it reflects the same amount of UV as it does visible light. If you were to use a coloured background, then coloured light could spill off that background and onto your sample. And if you have a grey standard positioned like this, in the same plane as the background, sitting above the background, then none of the light spilling off the background will actually hit the standard. So the standard can't control for the lighting changes if you were to use a coloured background. So the only coloured backgrounds you should use are ones that would be ecologically relevant for the thing you're measuring. Now when you take photos, it's really important that you don't end up with overexposed photos. Slightly underexposed is fine, that just means you're suffering slightly worse uh, noise for the signal that you get but overexposed photos can be completely unusable. Any pixel that becomes completely saturated, that means it reaches the top of the pixel range um, and can't go any higher, that means you lose data and you can't measure anything that is overexposed. So in order to make sure that you end up with good shots that aren't overexposed, I really like to use um, exposure bracketing. So all cameras let you do this. Uh, for example, in this camera you can go into um, the options here and uh, there's the bracket set where you can set the uh, auto exposure bracketing. So here for example we've got minus zero plus uh, and this is the area so we can specify what range we want to use. Uh, a range of about 1.3 to, to 2 exposure stops is, uh, um, is quite sensible. So now whenever I take a photo, it will automatically take three photos with different exposures, with different shutter speeds. Uh, that's the visible. And then I'll slide the filter across and do it again in UV. Now once we've taken the photos, it's always good practice to check the exposure of the photos. 
Now most cameras should be able to show you RGB histograms, red, green, blue histograms. Here you've got the red, green and blue. This UV shot looks very overexposed and you can see that the red here is all clustering up at the right hand of the histogram, so that means they're overexposed values. But this looks okay. Here you've got the, uh, the red near the top but not quite at it, so that implies most of the pixels in this photo are not overexposed. And then this is the underexposed one that looks fine. And again with the visible, these all look well exposed. Always check your, your photos because it's so dangerous to just lose all your data because of overexposure. Now I'll photograph the Rebecca again using a diffuser. That takes away the shadows nicely. Now I'll take the photos off the camera and put them on the computer and then go through the next steps of calibration and then analysis. In order to use our image analysis toolbox, you'll first need to download and install ImageJ. ImageJ is a cross-platform open source image analysis package. You can download it for free from here. Once you've done that, you can navigate to my website and on this page you'll find all of the files you need. I'm on Linux here, so I'll download the Linux version of the toolbox. There are Windows and Mac versions as well. Uh, also on this page you can download the user guide which has lots more useful information about how to use the toolbox and other tips. You can also download the paper. Now that I've downloaded that file, uh, you'll see it's a zip file that contains lots of other files and folders. And these are all the various parts of the toolbox. Next we need to install it and that entails extracting all of the contents of the toolbox to your ImageJ plugins directory. On Linux here that is in home.imagej plugins. On Windows that will be in C program files ImageJ and on Mac that will be in applications ImageJ. So all we need to do is select all of the files in the zip here and extract them. You can just drag them across and that's it. That's the toolbox installed. Now if we start ImageJ and click plugins you'll see that the multispectral toolbox tools have appeared here. I've transferred the images from my camera to my hard drive here but now we need to go through these images and work out which are the best to use in making a multispectral image. A nice piece of software for doing this is Raw Therapy. This is free and open source and cross-platform again. You can load up the thumbnails here and just scroll through them. This software is really good for checking the exposure and just generally checking that the photograph is in focus and everything looks okay. The first thing to make sure you use though is make sure you're using the neutral processing profile. Um, other profiles will apply gain to the images and mean that you can't really assess how well exposed they are. You can set neutral as your default processing profile as well. You'll notice at the top left here there's a histogram and this is really important for assessing the exposure of the image. This histogram looks quite good and you'll notice as I move my mouse around there are little bars under the histogram that show you the red, green and blue values under the pointer at that po moment. So under the white standard here the values are high and under the grey standard the values are low and on the black very low. This image looks fairly well exposed. Notice that the histogram is covering pretty much the whole range but there's no clustering at the top here. This UV image looks horribly overexposed. You see there's big clustering of lots of pixels at the top of the range here. As I move my mouse around you'll see that the red is at the peak. It's uh, saturated at the very top. There's even a little warning sign here at the top of the histogram. So this is a badly overexposed image. But this one looks great. So you'll see that the histogram is nice and spread, has a good even spread of pixel values. And as I move my mouse around, there are no values that are overexposed. 
and again this image looks underexposed this is all uh, a wasted region where there are very few pixels so all of the the um, the pixels are clustered around at very low values which means although this image would probably be usable it would be a very noisy image so this image looks good and this image looks good so now we can go back to image J and make a multispectral photo from these two to do that click plugins multispectral imaging and generate multispectral image this will bring up a load of options First, you need to select the the camera and um, filter setup that you have. Uh, if I were just measuring a normal standard human visible red, green, blue image, just select visible here. But here I'm combining a visible and a UV image, so I'll select that. In this case, the grey standard is in the same photo. Um, it is possible to have the grey standard in a separate photo, but if you do that, it's really important that that uh, that the photo of the grey standard is taken it with exactly the same camera settings that's the same shutter speed aperture and ISO as the photo that you're measuring estimate black point this is useful if you are only using one standard but that you might be getting some lens flare that's like bleeding into the side of the lenses um, reducing the contrast of your image in this case I've got uh, two levels of standard so I don't need that and I had a 5% and a 95% reflectance standard there so I'll put those two values in customize standard levels you only need to use this if you know that your standards were dirty for example if you took some photos and then realized that your your gray standard actually wasn't reflecting quite as much blue light as green and red then you can control for that by using this setting but that's very rare and you won't need that very often standards move between photos if I had moved my grey standard between my visible and my UV shot I would tick this box but um, as I haven't I don't need to tick that images sequential if the UV image uh, always followed the visible image in the folder then I could tick this and it would mean I wouldn't need to select that image again but um, as it is they're not sequential because um, there are a few pictures apart then you have alignment and scaling options obviously if you're only using a visible image there's no alignment to be done but because we're dealing with a visible and a UV image that we need to combine there might be a tiny bit of camera movement so we need to use some kind of alignment the options are apply none so if there really was no camera shake then you can use that um, automatic alignment um, attempts to automatically find the best alignment and manual alignment lets you just select uh, manually uh, the alignment the options here only refer to automatic alignment so it doesn't matter when you select manual alignment which values you choose here a custom alignment zone lets you choose the region that you want to align so I'm only really interested in making the snail well aligned so I'll uh, tick that save configuration file you'll pretty much always want to keep this ticked this is what saves the actual m-spec M image um, the only reason you'd want to untick this is just because you want to preview an image image output there are lots of options here the if you don't know what to go for the the safest option is align normalized um, with visible and UV if I was just using a visible image um, this is a good option because it actually showed me a color image at the end align normalized will show me a stack of gray images and each image will correspond to each channel here we put in the sample name so this was snail one and you can decide to rename the raw files or not next we need to navigate to the files so here we had this image for the visible and it's asking me to select the area to use for alignment and again I'm only interested in aligning the snail so I'll just select that next it asks me, asks me to uh, highlight the 5% standard 
and the 95% standard. Next it's asking me for the UV image, so I'll go and check that was this image. And here is the alignment, the manual alignment tool. You can press plus on your keyboard to zoom in and minus to zoom out. And all you need to do is drag one image over the other to try and get the best alignment possible. So you shouldn't be able to see any of these, uh, these yellow or blue fringes around anything. So you can do that by finding a nice little landmark like this and dragging it around until it has the best fit. Some lenses also will have um, a bit of chromatic distortion between the visible and UV and that will cause one of the images to be slightly bigger than the other. Um, in order to control for that you can use the plus and minus buttons here. So for example if I press, press minus a few times uh, it makes the yellow channel here smaller than the blue channel. this value looks okay. The values uh, of your offset are shown at the top right here. When you're happy with the alignment just press accept now check that the alignment is okay so I'm interested in making sure that there is good alignment between the UV invisible image for the snail here. So it just flips back and forth a few times to allow you to check that it's worked nicely. So this is a normalized multispectral stack. So you'll see as I scroll with my mouse wheel here, but you can use arrow keys as well. Notice how the white standard here always maintains the same level of gray uh, between the channels. And it tells you at the top left here what channel you're looking at. So this is the visible red channel visible green, visible blue, and then the ultraviolet blue and ultraviolet red channel. We can actually measure this image um, directly, but there are tools integrated with the toolbox that allow us to automatically measure regions once we've selected them. While I've got the image open here, I can select regions of interest. They're the things that we want to measure later on. So in order to, to, to select a region, I'll uh, choose a relevant tool. So um, I'll use the polygon tool for now, and I'll just very crudely select the snail. Once I've selected the region, uh, I'll press uh, a key on my keyboard that I want to associate with the snail. Um, normally you might think of pressing S, but S is uh, a special key for selecting the scale bar. So for now, I'll just press A, and it will describe this region as A1. If you look, this has opened up the ROI manager, region of interest manager, and added A1 uh, to, the, to the list of ROIs. Uh, you can, again, you can delete this ROI if you want, um, and you can modify it in any way. So if I um, deselect it and then reselect it, I can uh, just adjust it like this. That's nice and easy. Next, I want to select a scale bar. I'm going to be measuring the pattern in this image. So it's important when you're measuring pattern between images that every image is scaled to exactly the same number of pixels per millimeter or per meter, whatever the unit you're using. So I will just draw a line along the scale bar here. using the plus and minus keys to zoom in. It zooms in and out of wherever you have your mouse pointer at the time. Now that I've selected the scale bar, I press S on my keyboard and tell it how long the scale bar is. So this is 30 millimeters long. And that produces a scale bar here. This, the numbers on the scale bar uh, tell you that this is uh, just over 2000 pixels long and this is 30 millimeters. That's all that the multispectral image needs to use uh, and automatic scaling processes can then kick in later when you do batch processing. 
Once you're happy with the regions you've selected and scale bar you've selected, just press zero on your keyboard. And you'll see uh, in the log here, it says ROI saved. And if we look back at the directory containing our images, it's created this zip, so this zip file contains the selections we just made, and this mspec file is the multispectral image file that links with the raw images. Now you can just close this image, no need to save anything else, and you're done, you've created your first multispectral image. Now there's another tool I've recently added to the toolbox that lets you screen your images without using raw therapy. It's a slightly easier way of making multispectral images as well. So just go multispectral imaging and then photo screening. Again select your your camera settings so here again I want visible and UV. Select your raw file extensions uh, I'm working with a the NX1000 so they have uh, an SRW file and this is the Nikon and Canon, but you can add your own raw file extensions here. Here we have the grey standard option, so whether to estimate black point. Again, I don't need to do that. Standard reflectance values. Again, I'll just put in 5 and 95. And we can specify the preview size here, so this will depend on the size of your monitor. I'll go just leave it at 1000. Then I need to select the file containing all of the raw images. And this will start to load up all of the images and show us a histogram and a preview of the image. It takes a little bit of time to load all the images, but once that's done, it shows you a preview of each image and a histogram. The image has, is non-linear, so you can't measure this image. It's non-linear so that it looks good on your, on your computer screen. But the histogram here is measuring the linear values from the raw image. So this histogram is reliable at working out the, um, the exposure of your photograph. Another thing just to point out with the histogram is that it shows you here the percentage of pixels that are overexposed. So here there's a very high percentage and it's warning you that the, this image looks badly overexposed. There is a separate slice for every image in the directory. So you can scroll through again with your mouse wheel or arrow keys moving between images. So now I will just give you an example of how to make a multispectral image using this previewing software. So I've already made uh, the first snail one. Another really handy thing that this uh, screening tool does is it shows you where is overexposed. So you see the crosshatch red here. All of these pixels are overexposed so can't be used. So this, this photograph is completely useless um, if we were measuring any region around here. The snail itself here isn't actually overexposed, so we could measure these values, but we couldn't use this gray standard because it's overexposed. And this image looks good. So next we can actually select the uh, grey standards and photos we want to use to make a multispectral image just within this screening um, tool. So first uh, I'll select the visible photo, in this case this photo looks good. Then I'll draw a box over the 95% standard and check this. And then I'll find the best UV image, so this one looks good. I'll select the UV photo and the 95 standard. Then I'll just move this box and select the 5%. Go back to the visible image and select the 5%. So there we are. Now that we've selected all of the options here, this button has become activated. Right, now let's create multispectral image. Again, I'll just choose manual alignment um, and select a custom zone. This time, just in the, as an example, I'll show you what the pseudo UV output looks like. This is uh, a false color image output um, that is non-linear. So it's a nice way of previewing your image in color to make, um, make sure it's aligned and looks OK. And this is snail 2.
I just want to align the snail. It's useful to use little specks like this for alignment. That looks pretty good. Okay, so here we are with the false color image. There's just a warning that's come up telling you not to measure this image because it's non-linear um, and it's showing false color. So here, uh, the false color means that we're showing the visible green, the, the visible blue, which is coming across as green, and then the UV red, which is being um, shown as blue. So this image looks good, and again, we want to select the regions of interest, so I'll just very, very crudely select this now. When you hold down the space bar, it lets you drag an image. It just momentarily changes the cursor into a, a hand dragging tool, so I'll just show you. When I'm holding down the space bar, I can drag, release the space bar, and I can resume selecting. And you can double click to complete that. Then again, I'll call this A. It comes up as A1. And now I need to select the scale bar. Press S for the scale bar, and that's 30 millimeters long. and then press zero and there we go ROI saved with the image so we can close that now we're back at the photo screening image um, if you click reset it will get rid of all of the options you chose and allow you to make a new image so let's make the final snail shots There we're done. Press zero to save that and close. And finally, let's make the Rebecca M spec. So let's find the Rebecca images that work best. This UV Im image looks good. So I'll reset. Select the UV image and the 5% standard, the 95%, and this is a good visible image, I'll select that, the 95 and 5%, create M-spec, and again I'll just keep all these settings, um, I'll show it in aligned normalized 32-bit, and check the alignment looks okay. It looks very dark, but uh, from the silhouette you can tell it's quite well aligned. Now you can see there's lots of red, a fair bit of green, but very little blue and very little UV. In order to reload a multispectral image, you just need to go plugins, multispectral imaging, and load multispectral image then select the file that you want to load 
So if I load up the snail here, you'll see that this has loaded a normalized image and the selections we've made are available in the ROI manager. Before we can convert an image to cone catch values, we need to have generated a model that's specific to our camera and our visual system. So when you go cone models here, this shows you a list of all of the uh, cone mapping models that are on your system at the moment. Uh, by default, uh, these are the ones that uh, we've provided. In order to make your own, you just need to run generate cone mapping model. In order for this to work, you also need to have R installed on your system. Then we just select the camera uh, with the sensitivity curves and the, the lens combination as well. So in this case, we were using the NX1000 with a Novaflex. And then the 300 to 700 here, that spectral sensitivity is in the range from 300 to 700 nanometers. So that covers the ultraviolet and human visible range. If you're just making a model to work with the um, human spectral range from 400 to 700, then you'd select this version. So I'll select the 3 to 700. The Illuminant D65 is the general default. Next, select the animal that we want to map to. In this case, let's do Honeybee. The Training Spectra. So this is a database of natural spectra, spectra um, that's been collated partly from reflectance measurements that we've made in our lab, but also from the Fred Flower Reflectance Database. Then we can use model simplification if we want. Um, in general, it doesn't seem to improve anything much and uh, overfitting doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. Then we can set the maximum number of interaction terms. Uh, in this case, we have a trichromatic um, visual system in the honeybee. So we can allow maybe a three-way interaction. If we had a tetrachromatic system, actually two-way interactions um, so putting in two here is slightly more sensible. Otherwise, you end up with lots of three-way interactions that become quite complex. But because we have a trichromatic system, there can only be one three-way interaction, so that should be fine. Include square transforms. Um, again, it, it doesn't seem to be required. Um, whenever I've tested it, it doesn't seem to improve the model fit much. Um, diagnostic plots. This shows you, um, for example, QQ plots. Um, of how well the model fits the assumptions of normality of error structure. If you're on Windows, um, you need to specify the location of your rscript.exe file. So this will probably be the only thing you need to change here, depending on what version of R you currently have installed on your system. Um, so find your version of rscript.exe and find its path and just paste that in here. Click OK when you're done. It will take some time to calculate the the estimated camera responses and the responses of the visual system that you're interested in. Um, and then it will create a model that converts between these two. So here we go, that's finished. In the output here, it shows you how well the model has um, produced a fit between the camera and receptor sensitivities of the visual system you're interested in. So here for the BUV, there's an R squared of 0.998, pretty good, 998, 999. So these values are all very, very good fits. So the models have done a very good job at estimating um, the, the B cone catch values from the camera. Now if we uh, could just go refresh menus, you'll notice that when we go to cone models, here we have the one we've just created, the Novaflex Honeybee. 
Now that we've created that model, we can convert our Rebecca photo into B Vision. So let's go, um, let's open the Rebecca image. I'll load it. Here's the Rebecca multispectral stack. Then I can go um, multispectral imaging image analysis, convert to cone catch, and this just shows us a list of the available visual systems to map to. Here's the model that we just made, the um, NX1000 Novoflex Honeybee model. And here it's used the model to generate the cone catch image here. Uh, at the top left it shows you that this is the UV um, cone catch quanta, and then the next slice is the short wave and then the next medium wave. I can then, for example, just select a region of the image to measure. Um, if I go uh, measure, measure all slices, then it shows you the average measurement in the area I selected here of medium wave, short wave, and UV values in cone catch quanta. These values are on a 16-bit scale, so that allows you to save the image as a 16-bit TIFF if you want. Um, that means the top of the range here is uh, 2 to the power of 16, that's 65535, um, scale minus 1. Uh, so if you want to get reflectance values, for example, then you'd need to divide these numbers by 655.35. And you can measure multiple areas with this tool, so I'll just select another leaf, for example. And then you, once you've loaded this tool once, just press M and it will measure that bit for you. And again, I'll just select another bit. Press M and it measures it. There we are. This image, of course, doesn't look very useful. It's useful for measuring, um, but it's nice to be able to see what uh, it might look like to a honeybee sometimes. And there's a tool added to the toolbox that just lets you do that. Um, if I go into tools here and make presentation image, this allows us to uh, create a, a false color image from the channels of Honeybee Vision here. So I want to roughly make this as close to human vision as possible. So I will turn the medium wave into red, the short wave into green, and the UV into blue. So these are like human channels shifted down one wavelength band. Making the image non-linear is, is generally really nice for looking at things on computer monitors. So this linear image, you'll notice that dark things are really dark and light things are, are really light. That's because this is a linear image and your monitor uh, doesn't work in, in that linear way. Um, you can also convert to RGB color here, uh, which uh, makes it easier to save it, for example, as a JPEG image. So I'll click OK. So here we are. This is what it might look like to a honeybee approaching. You can see that actually um, there's quite a lot of de detail here that's not visible to a human. Uh, on the ends of the petals here, you see the purple color. That's because there's quite high UV reflectance uh, at the ends of the petals. Um, and again, this is not, not very visible to humans. I can convert this to human vision. Um, if I just go to the normalized image here, I can again go um, tools, make presentation image. And the, I'll, I'll just use the basic camera vision in this case, which will roughly equate to human vision. So I'll select the visible red, the visible green, and the visible blue from the camera. So this is camera red, green, blue vision. And I'll do a square root transform. So there we are. This is what it looks like roughly to us humans, and this is what it looks like to a honeybee. Now I'll just run through a little example of doing a pattern analysis on those snails. First, I'll just delete this Rebecca M spec so that we're just left with 
the snail multispectral images that we created earlier and the selection zones associated. Next we need to know the, the scale that we need to use um, when analysing the pattern on these snails. So the camera might have moved slightly. In some studies the camera won't always be the same distance exactly from the targets. Um, so we we'll want to know what scale to use. You can calculate the best scale to use with a built-in tool here. When you go image analysis, um, batch scale bar calculation and select the folder containing our snail M specs. This just goes through and counts the number of multispectral images and the, it measures the scale bar in each image. Here it tells you it's counted three multispectral images for the three snails. This minimum pixels per millimeter is the, the value that we're after. Um, in this case, the minimum and maximum are very similar because I had the camera on a, on a tripod, so uh, the scale bar was always exactly the same distance from the camera. Um, this minimum value uh, is important because we want a value that's equal to or lower than this value. If we select um, a scaling value that's higher than this, then we'll be scaling some images up. Uh, and that will be creating false pattern data. So it's very important that all images are scaled down. Uh, so choosing a value, in this case, let's just go with 70 pixels per millimeter. Uh, it also tells us that the uh, the smallest snail bar uh, scale bar is in snail one. Next, let's just open up one of the snail images and measure the size of the snail. So we're going to be measuring the pattern of the snail, but we don't want to measure patterns that are larger than the snail itself. Obviously, that wouldn't make sense. Next, there's a tool uh, to scale this image. So once we have a multispectral image loaded, it has this scale bar in the RRI manager here. You can go multispectral imaging tools, multispectral image scaler, and let's type in 70. Now this is, it's removed the scale bar and it has uh, applied the, the same selection zone and it's scaled the selection zone automatically. Uh, so even though we scale down the image, uh, the snail is still selected. So we don't want to measure patterns that are larger than this. This is the scale value that the images will be scaled to for pattern analysis. If we just use the line tool here, um, we can measure the distance across the snail. So in this case, uh, if you look at the the output in the image J bar. This is a length of about a thousand pixels. That's 1080 at the moment. So the, the length of the snail is about 1200 pixels and the width here is about a thousand. So let's say a thousand should be our cutoff. Okay, we're done with that. Now that we know the scale values uh, to use and the, the maximum size of the snail, we can run a batch multispectral image analysis. So we go image analysis, batch multispectral image analysis. Again, select the folder with snails. We should select the visual system to use. Um, if you just want to measure the objective image output, you can select none. There is um, a list here of all of the other model uh, models that you have. So we could, for example, see what these um, snails look like to blue tip vision when we're measuring the pattern. Adding human luminance channel, what this does is it creates an average of the red and green channels, which roughly approximates the human luminance channel. Uh, in this case, we, we don't want that because we're working with blue tit. Um, if I were to select a human output here or none, then I could tick this box and it would produce an output of the average of the red and green. Uh, yeah, for now I'll just select blue tit. Image scaling, that's the value of 70 pixels per millimeter that we want to use. Um, start processing at file number. If you're running a big batch analysis of hundreds of images, um, sometimes there might be a power cut or it might crash at some point. 
it will tell you the number it got to and you can restart processing um, at say it got to image number 50 then just type in 50 here and it will restart at 50 next it will load up the first image and apply the blue tit model and then we get the pattern and luminance options here we need to choose the luminance channel so for blue tits this will be the double cone channel which is DBL here if we'd selected the human luminance channel in the previous options dialog there'd be a luminance channel uh, in the options here uh, for for every different visual system that you use there will be a specific channel to use as the luminance channel so you need to decide which is the most sensible here we have the pattern analysis options um, so we can specify our, our minimum and maximum um, pattern size that we're going to measure in pixels so this is pixels after scaling to the 70 pixels per millimeter and it, it, you can't go any lower than two sensibly um, and if you set this to zero it turns pattern analysis off we can go up to a thousand um, uh, well it was just over a thousand so let's put in 1024 um, and I'll put in the step size of 2 and, mul and the step multiplier as multiply this means it will start at 2 and it will multiply that by 2 to have 4 then it will multiply that by 2 to have 8 and 16 and 32 and so on until it reaches 1024 output pattern spectrum this is useful if we're going to be comparing if we're going to make pairwise measurements between the snails of their pattern if we just want descriptive statistics of pattern then uh, you don't need to use this but if you're going to be comparing the pattern of one object to another then do tick this box output energy maps is completely optional um, they're not useful for anything except uh, they create quite interesting looking output of the pattern analysis process next there are luminance options so we can if we wanted we could see whether one snail has a different luminance to another in a pairwise analysis um, I'll leave this on for now if you want to turn this off just set this value to zero here you this uh, luminance difference analysis it basically creates a histogram and calculates the difference between the two histograms in much the same way as the pattern analysis so you need to specify the number of bands that, of luminance that you want to measure something any anything from um, I don't know about 20 to about 100 would make sense uh, and in this case our images are scaled so that they're between 0 and the 16 bit maximum which is 65535 um, and we'll leave this as linear for now if we wanted we could combine ROIs uh, if we had multiple snails in each photograph that we wanted to analyze as if they were one snail we could uh, press A here um, and it would combine any objects um, under the letter A I'll leave that clear for now I'll click go So as this runs you'll see there are luminance results being created here and pattern analysis results being created here so this is showing you the pattern size and the amount of energy at that spatial frequency once image analysis is completed all of the results are automatically saved as it goes to the directory containing the multispectral images so here you'll see three different files the the main image analysis results are in this file this shows you um, a row for every for image every image and every uh, region of interest selected in that image so if we had multiple snails selected in a single photo that would be snail a1 a2 etc and the um, the columns show you different uh, outputs so here we have the mean luminance and the uh, luminance standard deviation in this case luminance was the um, the double cone channel for the blue tit so if we look at the double mean here it's 13,000 it's exactly the same as the luminance mean it just uh, makes it easy to work out which is the luminance value that was measured 
It tells you the area here in pixels. This is after scaling to the 70 pixels per millimeter that we chose. And then you have uh, the descriptive um, values for the pattern analysis. So the maximum power, that's uh, how the, the maximum amount of energy. And then the frequency, the, the, the pixel size um, at which the maximum power was found. The proportion power, um, the sum power, mean power, standard deviation of power. These results, uh, the descriptive pattern statistics, obviously only shown if you chose to do pattern analysis. Uh, if you didn't do pattern analysis, then it uh, shows you all of the color measurements here. Here we have the UV mean and the UV standard deviation for the snails one, two, three. And then the short wave, medium wave, and long wave, and double. They're the main descriptive statistics. Then if we look at the pattern analysis results here, this is uh, it's showing these results because I chose to select um, to output the pattern spectrum results. Here is the pattern size in pixels after scaling to 70 uh, pixels per millimeter. Um, and the amount of energy at each scale is shown there. I also output the energy maps so that you could see them being created. Um, then you can load them back into ImageJ to have a look at what was going on. So here's Snail 1's energy map. And you can scroll through, um, and it tells you at the top here that this was the 8 pixel scale, the 16 pixel scale, 32, etc. So you can see that there's not much energy going on here, and then there's more and more energy as we get to larger scales. Next, if we want to compare the snails to each other, um, we can do a simple um, image analysis. Uh, so if we go data analysis, pattern luminance distribution different calculator. This will allow us to compare the the patterns of the snails to each other. So here uh, select pattern energy as the, the column containing all the useful data. I want to compare the region A1 to the region A1. So in this case uh, I'm comparing snail A1 in this image and I want to compare it to the snail A1 in this image and this image. So I want to select between photos. If I'd selected, um, if I'd taken a photo containing multiple snails, say all three snails were in one photo, I might have called the first snail A and the second B and the third C. And then I'd compare A to B and run it again and I could compare A to C, etc. So here we go. Here is a comparison of all of the snails. And this is the pattern energy difference. So according to this, snail 2 is close to snail 3, but snail 1 is not close to snail 2. So this is the largest number, and this is the smallest number. And we can see if that looks like it makes sense. Here is snail 1, and it's apparently very different to snail 2, which I think I'd agree with. but snail 2 is close to snail 3. So this is snail 2 and this is snail 3. So these two, they seem to have much lower pattern energy in general compared to snail 1, which has much more powerful markings. Following the batch analysis, we can also run a simple color difference measurement. So in order to do that, load up the overall data. From the batch analysis, it measured the, the ultraviolet mean, the shortwave mean, the medium and longwave means. So that's what we need for this blue tick example. Next run multispectral imaging, data analysis, color JND difference calculator. This calculates the Vorobiev and just noticeable difference um, calculation to work out how similar two colors are and whether they are above or below the just noticeable difference threshold. 
arguably you should only use this when the colours you're comparing are fairly similar to one another. You shouldn't use it for comparing really different colours, for, for example a bright red and a bright, a bright green patch wouldn't give particularly meaningful distance results with this calculation. Here we go, because we're comparing snails it makes sense to see, uh, for example, if, if one snail is closer to another. We need to choose the visual system and Weber fractions. Uh, here are the, the ones loaded by default. You can add your own um, by looking in the user guide. These Weber fractions uh, are based on the relative abundance of cone ratios um, and then with a Weber fraction overall applied. So I'll choose blue tit 0.05. If I choose blue tit 0.02, it's the same uh, relative cone abundances, but it's a slightly more conservative JND value. And we want to compare the region A1 to A1 between snail samples, uh, but between photos. OK. So here we are. The results show. You can see that um, snail 1 is very close to snail 2. There's a JND difference of about 1.3. The threshold value is about uh, 1. That means that with a, with a just noticeable difference value of 1, um, the animal would be expected to not notice the difference about half the time. But that depends very much on lighting conditions. So even the, the more different snails, um, one and three appear quite different in colour here. But that's still only a JND of 3.6, which under most lighting conditions would mean it's a very similar colour.